Hey everybody, I am here with my good friend, uh, Fernando, and we go way back. Um, when is the first time that we met? Was it in New York? It was, uh, 2016, I think. 2016, end of 2016, we were there for Boost. Mm -hmm. And we had happened to just be in a random Facebook group of a bunch of guys that wanted to feel special. And yeah. because we were making Single guys money. anonymous. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And uh, what's what's amazing is um, I remember getting to this Airbnb and trying to figure out where everyone's going to sleep. And there was a closet. Were you the one? Were you in the closet? No, I think that was Anthony. I think Anthony tried to, to jack my room. Uh, Anthony, if you're watching this. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think I came late, though, and I saw someone's stuff in my room. I was like, what is going on? But no, I had one of the bedrooms, thankfully. Okay. Okay. So we had a bed. We had a living room with like several air mattresses, a couch, and then there was a closet with an air mattress in it that was like a private room. It was almost like a pantry, and uh, it was it was maybe like twelve, fourteen of us just stuffed into this house. I gotta tell you, man, that moment changed the entire trajectory of the last six, seven years of my life. Um, it was about it was about recognizing. Uh, so many things for me around uh, who you surround yourself with, um, mm -hmm. being open and sharing uh, that abundance mentality that everyone had in the house about what's working for them, what's not working, sharing screenshots, talking about, hey, I'm having trouble with this product. I remember people, multiple people pulling up laptops and like tearing down like listings. Mm -hmm. and um, And you at the time, you were always like, I always thought of this. This is funny. I've never shared this with you. Um, I always like I was only doing maybe Jennifer and I were only doing like two or three million at the time. And I think you guys were doing maybe six to seven or eight million at the time. Mm -hmm. I always thought, OK, they're like a year and a half ahead of us. And I'm like, <laughs> as long as I maintain my growth of my pace of growth with with Fernando and Nick, then uh, we're good. Like we're doing good. And at some point you pulled away because I think we were hitting we were hitting a wall at like seven or eight million and you were on, on pace to do 30. And I'm like, man, that is beyond where we're at. Like they're pulling away. And you guys started to really figure out a lot around processes and teams and and an automation and SOPs. And Jennifer and I were still just banging our heads and just had our heads down working pretty much by ourselves. We didn't get our first employees until. Uh, maybe tw like full-time employees until like 2018. So I know that you you had built a large team. So um, I want to talk to you today a little bit about your journey, man. And uh, and and just, I, I've always looked up to you uh, as an entrepreneur and as a person and what you've accomplished in the space. And it means a lot, man, your friendship and what you've shared and the inspiration that you have for us. So I want to I wanna share that with my audience, man, because I think that um dude it's been special for me and i i know that you can share that magic with with others man so thank you for for doing this dude that's yeah very uh, best intro ever yeah that's uh, really touching i appreciate it man yeah i've honestly learned so much from you that's hard for fernando you guys have to understand him he's a good friend you have to understand fernando as giving and caring as he is with his friends he is fiercely competitive probably the most competitive <laughs> dude i know on the planet like <laughs> So, so like his friends, he'll take under his wing, but everyone else, you're an enemy, man. Like he's going <laughs> to. <laughs> so now uh, you're all his friend. And so, uh, so you're good. You're good. Um, yeah. As long as, you know, we're not racing or, you know, on the treadmill next to me, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, yeah, it's not good. Yeah. We got to get uh, on a pool sometime. That's where the only place I got a shot, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, awesome. Before you started, I, I know you're a little bit of your background, but I want you to be able to share it with everyone. And uh, there's probably stuff, there's definitely stuff I don't know. Um, I know that before you started Amazon, you were in the um, uh, tech space or like a startup space and you were kind of out of San Francisco, right? So tell, mm -hmm. tell us about that journey, um, like how it started, what kind of startup were you working on or like how did you get involved yeah. in that? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, quick backstory. Um, yeah, I mean, graduated from college. So Nick, my business partner, and I are best friends from college. 
Uh, we both started in corporate. I, I graduated in 09. Well, it seems like so long ago. But, you know, during a great time, you know, high, high to the economy, clearly. And then so I, I started my job in finance. Brutal. I hated it. I was there for 18 months. Realized that looking up at everybody like above me, nobody was was really happy. And so I knew there was like uh, I needed a change. I kind of interviewed uh, at every type of company and then um, ended up at a tech startup in L.A. called uh, Better Works at first. Um, Nick actually joined with me as well as most intense, funny job, like probably like an 80 percent pay cut uh, for my finance job. But we, we learned a lot about what to do, hiring, and then also what not to do because the company imploded uh, about it after a year. And then the best lessons we, in life have been failures for us, too, for sure. Totally. Yeah. And I mean, I was like, you know, we were 100 percent commissioned salespeople. We were making like twenty dollars a close uh, cold calling restaurants when like Groupon and Living Social were all huge. And so, like, I think it taught us a ton of grit. And um, yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I think I'm so thankful for that opportunity just because I think if you want to really move into entrepreneurship, you're going to take a pay cut and you're going to take a lot of risk. But we did it, thankfully, very early when we didn't have a ton of fixed expenses. And so it was a lot easier versus I have friends that, you know, start to do it later, you know, when you have a kid, a mortgage, and, and naturally it becomes a lot more challenging. There's a lot more like math you have to do. And so... Um, so the company implodes called better works. And then, uh, and we were a pretty hot company. We were like one of the darlings in LA at the time. And so we get hit up by every single like recruiter out there. And then, so we're in like, a lot of our friends are interviewing at Uber LinkedIn, like, and this is like Uber early, like sub 40, 50 employees. And so we're getting hit up by everybody. And then it's funny. I get this uh, message from this recruiter saying like, hey, I heard, you know, you were in charge, I was in charge of all the major partnerships, like 24 hour McDonald's, all that kind of stuff. And, um, and then he's like, I heard, you know, you're the guy for this new role. Um, would you be open to talking to this new company out of uh, Y Cometer in, uh, in San Francisco? And then I look at the brief of like the company, and then it's like exactly in the same space, which is a kind of employee perks. Uh, and then I was like, Oh, you know, I'm good. Like, thank you. And then it's like this like kind of like cheeky British guy, and he just shoots me back a message really quick. And he's like, Oh, are you too important now to talk to the CEO of like a Y Combinator company? And I was like, All right, like, yeah, I guess I'm not that like sweet. Like, I'll, I'll take the call. And then, um, and then yeah, I meet the CEO. He's a guy, I, I mean, just through and through, like hustler, like moved over from Japan, had barely learned like learned English at the time. And he just sells me hard and is just like, look, man. We need someone exactly with your background. Um, like I'll pay you more than like any, any of the other offers that you have. And you'll get the, the chance to learn how to build a company and actually really like um, have a seat at the table versus just being like another salesperson or whatever. And I was like, okay, this is like a pretty sweet offer. I'll basically learn how to build companies. And that was what happened. I joined, he hadn't even moved over from Japan at the time. So it was just two of us. One of my best friends currently, uh, Ilya, and I in an office. I'm in charge of all new customers. He's in charge of partnerships. Um, we had no product, no revenue, like nothing. And then we got to build it. I hired probably like 65, 70% of the team. I was in charge of sales, business development, marketing, support, account management, like basically everything. Um, and then, yeah, we scaled that to a few million in revenue. And then after two years, um, yeah, Nick and I were, um, we'd worked together, we we're friends from college. And so we were kind of just like, okay, we've helped build companies. He had taken a company from 4 million to 40 million that went public last year. Um, and so the two of us just kind of came together and said, okay, we've really learned how to scale businesses. Let's just do it for ourselves. So that was a really big decision at that time, because like you're getting to a company that has 2 million in ARR, you found product market fit probably at that time. And usually it's like you go from two to 20 and then yeah. you exit at an amazing multiple, you get acquired. You're probably only a couple years away from something big happening there and cashing in. Did you have to forego any equity in that company when you made the jump? Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, just like most startups, it's a four-year vest. So and I, 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 
never hit two years at any company employed other than my own. So it was like five days away. But uh, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, but I invested like almost two years uh, of equity. So I gave up basically half. Yeah. And so I guess you at least you had half at that point. And so then you and Nick get in, in and then how did you figure out FBA? Like, what, did you jump right into Amazon at that point? Did you already have that idea? Did you already learn a little bit about it? Or did you sit in a room and be like, all right, now what are we going to do? Yeah, it, it's funny. So we were just antsy to quit. And so we knew like I, I was working a good amount. Um, Nick was too. And so I think we knew that we wouldn't have like the discipline to to quit and like do this or sorry to do like moonlighting like or to like work at night and like you know put in the five six hours a day after after work and so we quit we didn't really have an idea um but we knew that we were going to do e-commerce just being non-technical we wouldn't have a real competitive advantage to go into like SaaS again and so yeah we were really committed to e-commerce and then like literally the week before my last day, like Nick called me with an idea, kind of building like a, a men's lifestyle site, kind of wholesaling other products and displaying it, kind of like Huckberry today. And so we kind of worked on that for four or five months. And then I remember like, one, a lot of brands were just like not willing to work with us because they're like, you're too small, blah, blah, blah. And we always get compared to Huckberry. So like, it was just like a losing battle. Um, but then two, when I like forecasted out like our growth rate and we were growing like, 10 15 percent week over week it was crazy but like you know when we forecasted that out it would take us like i think it was 18 months to get back to making six figures a year and then i was like dude i'm gonna run out of money way sooner than that like there's, there's like we need um yeah we need to find something else and we always joked like worst comes to worst we move into nick's mom's house she has like the most beautiful house in the world so it's like oh, you know we'll be roomies and uh and we'll get free food she'll love it uh but yeah so we kind of like put our passion project aside. We're like, okay, whatever, we did this. Like now we just need to make money. And at the same time, like kind of that entrepreneurial grit, right? Like I refuse to go back to being a head of sales and and getting like a, a, a really well-paying job, kind of like stubbornly. And so I was actually, both of us were actually driving for Uber in the evenings to basically keep all the money into the company and not have to take, um, take out distributions. Uh, but then how we ended up uh, learning about Amazon was uh, we were listening to podcasts. I think it might have been Smart Passive Income or one of those. And then there was like a few early podcasts of resellers, like people doing like retail arbitrage. I remember that. And then one of our buddies that had done really well in e-commerce had, had also bought and resold kind of private label, but on eBay. And then, so that was actually going to be our first move, uh, was actually to go buying and reselling on eBay, which is kind of hilarious in, in hindsight, like Terra Peak was really big at the time. And then, um, and then, yeah, we're working on like the model we're like kind of, at, and, um, so on the business model and then, you know, we're at Nick's apartment, he gets uh, a package from Amazon. He brings it inside and we're just kind of looking at it and we're like, wait, why are we selling on eBay if we buy everything on Amazon as consumers, right? But at the time, like, you didn't know that you could actually even sell 3P on Amazon. So we Google it. Uh, we find, like, a sorry, Matt Clark. Uh, but, yeah, like, a torrented version of, like, ASM at the time. And then we're just like, okay, this seems way more feasible. And so we just dropped everything and then kind of moved into, like, the private label space. What was your first product? We launched four. Uh, we did silicon grill gloves. Great, great move. Yeah, that was a mess. Uh, um, uh, ice cube, the the large like whiskey ice cube trays, like the kind of the block ones. Yeah. We did the spear ones, and then we did um, kind of those like balaclava, like the face mask looks like you're gonna rob a place. Like we did those two all, all the same time. It was uh, yeah, I should show. Which one hit for like, you? Like what? Like what was what? What'd you learn? <laughs> Yeah, it's a good question. So, you know, I, even though I probably would not advise this today, I think at the time it ended up being awesome for us because it taught us differentiation from a really early point, right? Like the the face mask killed it. And then, but then we learned seasonality because we've reordered. And, you know, at the time, like we didn't have all like the brand analytics and all the amazing tools that help us today. Yeah. But we just thought like, oh, I mean, this product can be used for motorcycles and for paintball and everything. So it's going to clearly be like year round but then you just saw it like plummet um yeah, into yeah. the summer but it's fun uh we we still made a great amount of money like uh in the beginning that helped kind of help fund the company 
the silicon grill gloves were like yeah a downhill battle um but we were able to clear it out through like the first prime day so that was like really helpful um but yeah i think it was just so much around like differentiation ordering enough units i think we were ordering like I don't know, 300 units per. And then, so we just like ran out of all the ones that like hit uh, really quickly. And then honestly, it was just so much about like margin. You know, I think, um, I I think in the beginning, you know, when you're first learning, you're just like so excited about the revenue numbers all the time, not paying attention uh, to the, like your contribution margin and and just so many of like the little like kind of fine tuning parts of running an Amazon business that just end up being what actually matters. Um, it's so like, it's so funny you say a lot of these things are still problems that I see on a regular basis with uh, newer sellers. Is uh, they, they face these same exact issues where they're like, "It's good, I'm going to make two dollars every time it sells," and then mm-hmm. they didn't calculate the fact that they have to bounce it off of a three PL pay someone mm-hmm. to unload the container, put it on a pallet, pay for the palletization, pay for the storage, pay for that truck back into Amazon. And next thing you know, that $2 disappeared. Mm-hmm. And they're like, but I did 50K last month. And you're like, yeah, how much did you make? Right? Like, what is your net net? You know, mm-hmm. and so, then, you know, you really got to crunch those numbers. And I remember yeah. back in the day, we had similar issues where we re- we were selling a lot of small and light and smaller things. And we were just pumping a lot of units. And it was like, man, by the time you did the math, we were making like 50 cents a unit. And I was like, man, wh- what are we killing ourselves for? You know, we're moving a lot of volume, but it's it's not we're not making any money. Right. So you start to you start to realize, like, you got to the contribution margin is a matter of like where you're going to focus your energy mm-hmm. and then cut that bottom off. And a lot we let a lot of profitable products go. I'm sure you have as well over the years. And new sellers would be like, wow, like you that was making you money. And it's like, no, it was costing me money actually uh, Mm -hmm. to run it. Right. Because it it stifles your growth. You just can't like, you have limited resources with time, capital and people. Um, And when you're scaling the team before you scale the team, that's the biggest thing. So yeah. Awesome lessons there. Uh, We were super early with electronics, terrible decision. Uh, You know, we were early with like true wireless earbuds. I think we may have even had those when we were in New York with you. Uh, We were definitely doing like Apple accessories and we were doing some other stuff. Did really well, made a lot of money, but then got attacked constantly and just had all these issues over time. And then we were doing Apple watch bands for a while, too. And we had a million SKUs. It was so bad. It was uh, 20 colors like each. We Mm -hmm. had like 10 different styles, 20 different colors, two different sizes. We'd have to manage hundreds of SKUs uh, to 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 keep up with it, uh, and it was just like, what are we, you know, what are we even doing here? So, I uh, great lessons to learn. So, at, what was the turning point for you where it went from finding more products to thinking in terms of brand? Because you your your biggest brand may have been more of a general all purpose brand, or was it multiple brands? Like, at what yeah, point? Yeah, I mean. Did you really start to think in terms of branding? Yeah, I don't know if we've ever been like the best at branding. I think we started investing a lot more in the the design of the brands. Yeah, maybe like in 2018, like product design. You know, like, you know, before we would just have like just whatever, like whatever kind of designs, and we would just throw it up really quickly. Yeah, and then meet the market for you. Yeah, exactly. We're, yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Just like all speed to market. But, and then I think now we invest a lot more in like the brand identity, like earlier on, like in the story and everything else. Um, And I think that's been like a big shift for us. Um, But I would say we're still not as good as like a typical like D2C brand, I I would say. I think we're, we're good relative to like other Amazon sellers for sure. Yeah. Uh, but if you're looking at an omnichannel brand, we're, we're probably still way behind. It's so funny because it was, that was like a secondary thought for us as well for a long time. And it wasn't until we really started to double down on the toy business, which we didn't launch the toy business really until 2018. We were doing some toys under other brands, but mm-hmm. the true toy business and, it's, and that that's going to do over 20 million this year. We didn't, we did not focus that was the first time we really doubled down on a brand and said, okay, this is going to be, you know, we always looked at like maybe a Melissa and Doug as mm-hmm. like an example of someone that we wanted to like, uh, you know, emulate. 
Uh, mm -hmm. We want branding around the, this toy brand type of thing. But before that, like the way that Amazon FBA works and the way that private label works for you and I is identifying opportunities and being quick to get to, to, to capture those opportunities, first to market, early to market, speed, um, and then being better and more efficient than the competition at ranking and SEO. That's how you win, right? So it, for us, yeah, we were the same way. We had all these different brands. At some point, I think we had like seven or eight active brands across three or four accounts. Mm -hmm. And at one point, and we just started saying, what are we doing? Again, what are we doing, right? Like, <laughs> we need to kind of focus here a little bit. Um, this is a good opportunity for us to maybe pause. Uh, my my editing guy can do the magic of putting in a commercial for, for <laughs> Camp Ecom here. Are you ready to rethink Amazon conferences? So many conferences and we've seen hundreds of talks. We've been speakers and we've been sponsors. And what we've learned is that conferences need to change. On January 8th through 10th in Orlando, we are hosting Camp Ecom, a first of its kind interactive Amazon conference at the beautiful Doubletree Resort at SeaWorld. So get your tickets now and we'll save you a spot by the campfire. All right, now we're back. So uh, it's uh, you're speaking at Camp Ecom, and you're going to be on the executive side. So we're in it's two simultaneous events. It's uh, enter, it's basically executives that are doing mid seven figures that are looking to go to fifty million and a hundred million. The the wall that you hit that everyone hits at that point is really around processes, teams, planning, business management practices. You're one of the first guys in my circle or that I know that figured that out, right? So that's where like you you blew past everybody. You accelerated past the guys that I knew that were in our circle is because you really figured out a lot of this, uh, you know, this part of the business. And it's taken us a long time to really get there. Like we, we got, we hit that wall at 12 million, but we've been working. It was actually you that referred our executive coach com uh, coaching company, our CEO coaching mm -hmm. company. Because I reached out to you because I respected what you had done. And I'm like, who are you using? And I had seen someone mention something about coaching. And mm -hmm. so we've been hit with him for two years now. That's awesome. And it's taken two long years to learn it and implement it, like understand it, and then hire the people and then train those people to ha have a clear path to become middle and upper management. Mm -hmm. It's a long process. And most First of all, most people are lazy. Most people are impatient. They want now. They want money now, right? And that's one of the biggest problems that that you see with the, you know coming into business. But we knew it was a long haul thing that we needed to really figure this out. And once we started training, training, training these associates on how to become juniors and giving them a clear path to become a junior, and then giving them a clear path to become a senior and start layering the org chart this way, I want to hear about your journey with this because you. I know you had a couple key personnel that really helped you in this part, but your background with, even when you're talking about the startup that you were working with in San Francisco, you were in charge of hiring this entire department, this whole entire revenue mm -hmm. department, basically. That had to be a huge help for you with understanding how to scale your Amazon brand. So when when did you first make that decision? You're like, I need a lot more people and I need, I need these processes in place. Yeah, it's a good question. I think we we made our first hire in the Amazon business probably like six months in. Nick was handling a lot of like support tickets and everything. And I just remember looking at him like, dude, why are you doing this? Like, this is like the like worst thing like you could be doing. Customer like, service has to be the first thing you get rid yeah, of. Like, yeah, like first thing. And I was like, dude, you need to get rid of this like quick. Like, this doesn't make sense. But I think I've always been like a person that, you know, actually, I mean, tying it back to um, um, the startup, I remember very distinctly, I was trying to put together this new deck and uh, we had like an intern at the office and like in th this deck in my, like, I had it in my mind, but like I had been putting it off for like three months, four months, and then just like too busy, like, you know, hiring or whatever, like coaching people hitting like, you know, new sales goals. And then I just looked at the intern and we were grabbing like lunch one day. And I was like, hey, can you like take this on and like, you know, kind of explain it to her. She came back, you know, within like a day and she was pumped to work on it. 
Uh, and then she came back in a day and did it way better than I would have ever done. And I think it made me realize that like, if I put, if I'm giving up like, you know, 5% of my time to this one thing, like let's say this like marketing thing, like I'm going to do a pretty crappy job, especially if I'm not like excited about this job. And then, so I should just find someone that's going to like dedicate a hundred percent of their time. They're going to be excited about it. They like love this job. And ideally they're actually better than me at this job anyways and then like my business will grow and as long as i'm prioritizing the right people that can add more value than they're obviously like costing the company then it's always a good trade and so i mean that's just generally how i think about it in like you know like another like way that like one of my buddies brought it up it's like okay if i'm talking to whatever this one colleague like am i smarter than them who knows maybe maybe not but like again it's like thinking about that percentage of time, right? If I'm like dedicating 10% of my time to product development, am I 10 times smarter than like the head of product development or whatever? And it's probably not, right? And so I, I think at, at the end of the day, and it, even if you are, then that means you made the wrong decision to hire them because they're, they're not the right person in that seat. And so I think for me, it's always like kind of coming back to that and realizing like, okay, I'm not that smart. And so I need to find like, the right people in the right seats and prioritize filling those roles and then our company will do well. And so uh, I think, yeah, I guess going back to like when we started scaling, um, yeah, I think we started really hiring pretty early on. Uh, I mean, we like our first listings went live in early 2015 and then we started pretty aggressively hiring, I think in, in 2016. Um, so about a, a year in, and then in the beginning, we'd, we'd start building on a U.S. team. And then over time, we just realized like, you know, Amazon's volatile. Margins can get pr compressed really quickly. And it, it was just it's too challenging as a bootstrapped company to have like a full U.S. team. And so when you made I, that transition, because I remember you posting about it and us discussing it. Yeah, I think I visited your office in california at that time in la uh and you had um you had a big office space but it was almost empty and you were just making that transition i think you ended up getting rid of that office too right yeah well, we got rid of all of our offices now yeah, yeah. now we're completely remote but yeah we had like a sweet corner we work office in like 35th floor of downtown la which is sweet i mean it was impressive to friends and everything. it was beautiful and impressive it may have helped yeah. you raise some money uh, yeah uh yeah seriously but I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. You know what I mean? Like I I'm much actually Anything. happier not going through traffic in LA and just working out of like my home or Airbnb or whatever. hundred um, percent. But yeah, I mean, I think for us, like, yeah, we realized that we could augment a lot of our leadership team with the uh, people in the Philippines. So that was our first thing. It's like, okay, we're, we're going to give if we have one person in the U.S., we'll hire like two or three people that will basically be like assistants uh, to the team uh, here locally. And then as we just kept going through it, it was just like, look, we just need to keep raising our bar of like the, the talent that we hire internationally. And if we continue to do that, we don't need to continue hiring in the U.S. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we eventually like let go. I remember like one of our supply chain managers and, and he's a good guy, like had no experience with, with supply chain, was probably making, I don't know, 60 grand, 65 grand a year. And then we hired our first supply chain person uh, in the Philippines uh, to kind of replace him. And I mean, she was a fraction of the cost. I mean, I'm talking about like- $4 yeah. an hour? Yeah, probably like 800 bucks a month. Yeah, so give or take around that at the time. And truthfully, she yeah. knew supply chain- five times better like true yeah like, she honestly. was experienced in it knew it a lot better it was so production went up cost went way down and that, exactly that, that's a light bulb moment for a lot of people now let's mm -hmm. pause here really quickly because we're gonna have people like four dollars an hour yeah. that's good money at especially that back then i mean rates have gone up a little bit with, with for sure people that work in the philippines for you first of all english is their first language they're highly educated they work their asses off they're great people and the cost of living there, the U.S. dollar goes so far that a college-educated professor makes like five or six dollars an hour, right? So, mm -hmm. like, you're talking about doctors making seven, eight, ten, you know, under ten dollars an hour. So, you're talking 
when you pay someone to come into your company and you're paying them five, six, seven dollars an hour, you're paying them very good money and they can have a very good living and take care of their family. So you don't need to f- try to compare it. Don't compare it to like hiring someone in New York or Miami or something. I totally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, so and, oh, yeah I want to be pause and, like give that disclaimer because I don't want to get canceled. <laughs> yeah, that, that's fair. Uh, yeah. To add to the non, hopefully we both don't get canceled, but I think that one, that was five, she just hit her five years. So like that was one, a long time ago. She uh, makes much more now. Um, and and she 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 earns it like she she deserves for sure but then well, they also get a month bonus every year too they get a 13th they get a 13th month right totally yeah yeah, yeah. but I, I think the other thing is that like if you're living in manila like the capital of the philippines right like you could be sitting in traffic very easily for an hour and a half to two hours each day and because it's such a like family oriented culture like that's it uh, that sucks right they don't work as much like uh generally as the people in the u.s uh it, or it's not as huge of a priority I, I would say and so i think if you're able to create like a great company culture allow people to work from home and then they're saving that three to four hours of traffic like that's huge especially like post covid when you think about like a lot of people don't feel comfortable like going back to the office still and so i think there's um yeah there's a lot to be said about just like the environment and like the overall experience that you're creating not just necessarily like the hourly rate yeah i think that the biggest challenges for people that want to start to grow a team there are going to be around like hr training accountability making sure that people are actually working for you and not moonlighting or working for multiple companies um Mm -hmm. and then and then the communication with with the team um you were able to solve a lot of that because you had a couple of key personnel, like some upper management people that you, that you basically let it off for you over there. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, we started, I think everybody kind of starts, uh, is a generalization, but I think, okay. First time entrepreneurs, generally what I see is they hire like kind of like what we did. We hire assistants and like the kind of generalists. And then over time you start hiring more specialists Maybe at some point in there, you promote one of those people to become like the manager. So you have like this kind of homegrown manager that doesn't hasn't really managed usually in the past. And then and then you start bringing in like outside managers. You start like kind of dividing into functions. Then eventually, like you might hire like a VP that's like kind of in charge. And this person is has like not executed in a while. They've only managed and then like eventually you've like you hire more and more vp level people that are again not doing individual contributor work they're really just like managing teams and then setting objectives like key results all that kind of stuff um yeah i mean and, and that's like the path that we followed it's a path that i think a lot of uh entrepreneurs follow but i would say for us yeah i think what what really helped us scale is yeah having really strong middle management that like cared about the organization and then like at at the end of the day they were kind of doing a lot of that like accountability the policing and stuff uh but if i were to do it all over again and i have the budget i would probably go somewhat in the reverse order where you hire like uh, that vp first allows them to like build out the team and maybe it's even like a broader scope vp type of role or like whatever an integrator coo role um and then and then bringing like the the middle level management and then like the individual contributors it's hard to do uh, unless you have like outside money um but like that's how i would do it today 100 percent. and so this was the exact struggle that we went with where we hit our wall which was and 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 the path that most people take which is as a solopreneur you can do a few million dollars on amazon right like just you and nick just me and jennifer we could hit a few million bucks with no problem, right? Like we'd launch 10, 20 products, just be in the weeds and do it all ourselves. <laughs> we would have a VA doing our customer service. That's about it, right? But then you need to start hiring those specialists. And so you're like, okay, this guy's going to help us with PPC. We got to train him. This guy's going to help us with supply chain. This guy's going to help us here, uh, design, right? And so like you start to fill out like these, like you, as it is when it's just two of you, you still have the org chart there. It doesn't disappear, it's just you're wearing all those hats, right? It's like either mm-hmm. you or your partner or just you, you're in every single seat. You still have those KPIs. You still have that mm-hmm. job. You still have those the responsibilities, but uh, it's you, right? And so mm-hmm. 
then what you're doing is you're starting to replace like different roles with different specialists. But again, those people aren't necessarily management material. They don't know how to manage, but they're just, you know, they're good. The key at that point, I think, is that you need to hire potential managers, right? People that can grow. And for us, what it, the the wall was, okay, how do we really get, find the right person, understand what makes a, an A player? How do we identify the skill set in somebody we're interviewing to know whether they have the potential to grow in that role to a junior and senior manager? And you have to be thinking about, even though they're coming into an associate role, you have to be qualifying them for a management position as you're even interviewing them. If they're not mm -hmm. good enough to grow in your company, they're not good enough to work for you. You kind of just have to mm -hmm. move on, right? And totally. so for us, it was like out of desperation. We're like, whoever wants to work for us, you got the job, right? We need you like yesterday. We have way too many SKUs. We're overworked. We're killing ourselves. And then, you know, but like, as you, you don't realize that hiring the wrong person costs you like 15 months of their salary and pain. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's worth that extra week or two and 10 more interviews to find the right person and be able to identify. But learning how to, how to interview, learning how to identify, uh, you know, the right person and a player, that's really hard. That, that was something that was really, really key for us. So you have so many superpowers with regards to running a company and scaling it and growing it, the finance side, raising capital, being a CEO. Um, what would you say is like your biggest, your best superpower? Like, like maybe it's a combination of things, but what would you say is like the main thing that you're the best at? Oh man. Uh, that's a good question. Yeah. I think it's probably, yeah, like a tie between, yeah, like hiring and building teams and then kind of just seeing where the puck is moving and just like overall, like, you know, I, I don't have as much day-to-day -day responsibilities. So that like helps obviously with like 70 plus people now. And so I, I spend a lot of time like, like coming up with ideas and just trying to figure out like, all right, how are we going to like 10 X over the next three years or whatever that is. So, um, so it's yeah. something for people who are watching to understand is like an upper management your personality type means a, a lot, right? Like what you, the type of person you're naturally are, and then your adaptive personality, you can't take someone who is uh, like, um, you know, very outgoing uh, and, a, and a strong natural leader and then have them sitting and living in spreadsheets all day. Mm -hmm. And you can't take that someone that loves numbers and crunching numbers and is very conservative and just wants to live in the detail and you can't have them live in the vi like driving the vision of the company uh both of those people are going to be very uncomfortable outside of their like what they're not who they naturally are and so uh, you you what i'm hearing from you is that you you're basically um a visionary you motivate teams and you're good at identifying and relating to people to identify whether they're the right person for the job and yeah, getting people growing in the right direction. Yeah, generally, I think that those are probably like the the areas that I'm like best at. Yeah, I think it's a good. I think it's a good summary. And then Nick, Nick compliments you really well. He likes being in the weeds, and he he's he's like an operator. Is he your? Yeah, like, definitely. So, yeah. so in EOS, they call it integrator. Right. But like, is he your integrator? You're the visionary type of. Yeah, I mean, I think you know we don't use those titles as much. I think he's definitely much more like operational in terms of like you know uh coming up with a lot of like the like re reviewing the amazon strategy you know holding people accountable or you know they say like keeping the trains like running on time but we have like actually multiple people within the, uh, the organization that are doing that at this point teams. yeah at this point you have to um right? but um but yeah i mean he, he also comes up with a lot of like yeah phenomenal ideas as well so thankfully we have that like kind of going back and forth but yeah i would say like the majority of like the ideas or like maybe the vision is coming uh for me but we both like kind of balance each other out pretty well and that kind of stuff cool well i want to just shift to like what you're currently working on because you know since i've known you you've grown massive brands have you you've, have you had an exit? I don't know for sure. You had an exit. Yeah, we, we exited uh, one set of brands and then we exited Pixelfy last year too. So, so you exited a software, Pixelfy.me. 
you uh, software to help people like with uh, shortening and tracking and stuff. It was great, mm -hmm. great, great while it was really helpful for a long time. Uh, and then you you exited a brand, so you had some, got some cash in your pocket, able to cash out a little bit, get some com get comfortable, help probably help pay for the wedding a little bit. Congratulations! <laughs> yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Helps with the wedding, yeah, for sure. Yeah, congratulations! Um, Thank you. And then since then, you've you've grown more brands you own, mm -hmm. and you have an agency. So let let me like, what are you working on? Like, tell me about some of these new brands um, that you work that you've worked on. How big are they? How many brands? And then tell me about your agency. Yeah, so the brands we launched them in 2020. Uh, we've launched a few supplement, or sorry, 2020 and 2021. We've launched probably like four supplement brands combined. I don't know, doing probably like uh, around 20 million a year now. Um, and then, so yeah, I mean, we awesome. we scaled them really quickly. They're they're all doing really well right now. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, we're we're looking at it as like a portfolio of supplement brands, and so we're excited. I think. Uh, Next year, yeah, we're going to start probably um, well, obviously scaling those further, launching more products, and then uh, and then starting to do more acquisitions. And so kind of building our own kind of like aggregator in a sense, but just like really focus on that specific product type since it's something we know really well. And then uh, and then the agency we started back in like maybe 2018, 2019. Um, but yeah, I mean, just naturally, we had a lot of friends in the space. A lot were like in CPG or direct-to-consumer. And then they knew that we had scaled on Amazon like pretty big without really like a, a great brand. And so like, well, if you can do it with this, then you can definitely do it with our brands. And so, um, so yeah, we had like the resources and like naturally like the teams and the systems that we've been talking about. And so, yeah, we just kind of spun out like an agency and, it, and it's been doing really well. And so it's pretty much a full service agency. I think what, what's the name of it? Uh, Marketplace Ops. And so, yeah, I think what people like about us probably the best is that we're, we're really, really strong in launching, uh, but then just like the caliber of our team again. And so, you know, you're not like getting one of those like interns that just learned how to sell on Amazon like two weeks ago. Like you actually have someone that's sold like millions and millions like on the platform. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, we do that. Um, and then we, yeah, we just like launched like uh, kind of more like a la carte services. So like PPC only, supply chain only, all that kind of stuff, launch only. Uh, but yeah, the, like the big picture of how we think about it is naturally like the agency is phenomenal for uh, for a diversified revenue stream, which is really nice. Uh, it's not like Walmart.com, but it actually drives revenue, uh, meaningful revenue. And then um, but it all, also covers like for a lot of the lights and a lot of our expenses and allows us to hire ahead. Um, but it's naturally a much more difficult business to scale, right? Like your payroll and your revenue are always kind of going in tandem. And then. Uh, but it drives free cash flow that we can redeploy into our supplement brands, uh, which is way easier to scale um, and does not like it's not parallel to your payroll. And so that's kind of how we think about it in terms of, like, I guess, a flywheel. And that's what we're up to. I love it, man. It's uh, it's phenomenal. I'm going to I'm going to hit you with some quick questions, but I want to ask you about that. You're like. You, you made a great point. It's uh, you can do it with any made up brand that doesn't have a presence. No one's ever heard of. How much easier is it when people have actually heard of the brand? Oh man, it's so, so dumb, easy. right? It's so, so much dumb. easier. <laughs> Crazy, it's so yeah. Dumb. All right, cool, man. What um, real quick, rapid fire questions to wrap us up. Uh, you know what what books are you reading right now? Uh, like what are you reading? Oh, I'm reading this one. What is it called? It's called like ramping your brand. It's more for like people that are kind of thinking more about like building an actual brand so I'm ramping your brand is what it's called by James Richardson uh it's really good uh yeah this guy is like um I think like an anthropologist or some some kind of like scientific just like under like really understanding like the psychology of of consumer behavior around building brands and everything and it's just really fascinating awesome how much is enough when is uh when's the when's what's your num what's your number Oh, well, okay. I, I think I preface it. So I have a goal and then how much is enough? Uh, my, uh, that's a good question. I, I love what I do. Truthfully, even if I hit the goal, it's not going to be enough because it's, it's a game to me. And it's like, it's a way of keeping score, uh, truthfully. And, and I'm competitive, like you said earlier. Um, but my goal is a hundred million net worth. 
Dude, I'm surprised you're not there already, man. It sounds like you're already there. <laughs> you're worth no. more than that to me, man. So I appreciate uh, you coming on. I, I love you, bro. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thank you.